Outside of that, take your copy of God's Word and open it to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. By most measures, he was a nondescript, average guy. A white male, kind of youngish, wearing blue jeans and a long sleeve t shirt and a Washington Nationals cap. Into the subway, he carried into Washington a violin. Once he got near the escalators, he pulled out the violin, laid the case down at his feet, facing the traffic, and got out his violin. He was there at the request of the Washington Post. He got set, he got ready, he placed it up to his chin and began to play. He looked like an average guy. But was he just an average guy? For 43 minutes, he played the violin in the subway. He played six classical pieces, and 1,097 people walked by while this man was playing the violin. No one knew it, but the man who had that instrument in his hands that day, in that metro near the escalators, was one of the world's most premier violinists. A man that will make a thousand dollars a minute to play. Playing upon a Stradivarius. And if you know anything about violins or if you've ever heard anything, a Stradivarius is the most expensive violin. As a matter of fact, this man spent $3.5 million for the violin he was playing that day in the subway. His name is Joshua Bell. This happened on January the 12th, 2007. And what is so interesting is that even though this man could make $1,000 a minute playing a $3.5 million instrument, over 1,000 people just walked right on by. As a matter of fact, there's only seven people that actually stopped and paused during that entire 43 minutes. He actually gathered $32 and some change that day. He actually said in the article that he was used to playing in places like Symphony Hall. Just three days earlier, he had played at Symphony Hall. And if someone coughed during his performance, he would get upset. But in the subway, he found himself playing and dying to just get someone's attention in the midst of it. As you actually look at the article, there is some very interesting things that is said in there, but one of the things that Joshua Bell said, he said, I'm surprised at the number of people who don't pay attention at all, as if I'm invisible. Because you know what? He said, I'm making a lot of noise. And it was beautiful noise. The article is quoted by saying this, If we can't take the time out of our lives to stay a moment and listen to one of the best musicians on earth, play some of the best music ever written, If the surge of modern life so overpowers us that we are deaf and blind to something like like that, the article asks this question, then what else are we missing? I ask you, what else are we missing? You know, could it be that we're, we're missing some of the most beautiful things in our lives right in the midst of our days? Could it be that we're missing some of the most beautiful things in our life, Mr. Joe, right in the midst of the most... Horrible, horrible days of our life in the midst of our pain. Could it be that we're missing something beautiful in the moments of uncertainty and sorrow and pain? Can I tell you something? There's something beautiful in all that. I'm not saying the pain's beautiful. I'm not saying the sorrow's beautiful. I'm saying there's something in all of that that can be very beautiful. And if we focus only on the hurt, we will never get to see what is really there. It's beautiful. What is sad about the experiment is not the, the, mu- the music the people miss, but because it reveals the way we live our lives. We live our lives 
going to and fro, hurrying about, and failing to see the beauty of what's plainly in front of our eyes, what's right in our presence. Could it be that there is some things in your life that you've been missing? Maybe you come today and you're needing a new beginning. Maybe you're, you're coming today going, my, my life's a mess. I try to get ahead and I don't get anywhere. You've come to the right place. Because I want to tell you how to begin a new beginning. And next week we're going to follow this message up and talk about a new creation. And then we're going to talk about a masterpiece the uh, first Sunday in May. But you've come to the right place today. Even if you have a new beginning and you feel like things are going well for you, there's going to come a time. Because in case you haven't figured it out, life can be tough. Sometimes life will throw you a curveball you were not expecting. And all of a sudden you find yourself feeling things and thinking things you never thought would happen. Today we find ourselves in Luke chapter 24. Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has been taken off the cross and Jesus has been placed in the tomb. Praise be to God, we celebrate today he didn't stay. But we come to a place after, after there's been a visit to the tomb to see that it was empty and see the grave clothes that were there. And we come to a place in verse 13 today about two disciples. Two disciples that are leaving town. And this is the first day of the week that they're doing this. And if you'll read with me in verses 13, beginning there through 15 to start with. The Word of God proclaims this, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus Himself approached and began traveling with them. You know, it's one thing to hear a message. It's one thing to hear someone say something. It's another one to experience something. It's another to see something and to focus on something and get something. See, it's one thing to come to church and hear me proclaim something. It's another thing to go out, out of here and experience that same thing. You can come today and, and, and say, I've come, I'm, I'm, I'm beat down, and I'm struggling, and I'm hurting. And you may have come to hear something today, but my prayer is not that you hear something today, but that you experience something today. And that is the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because He is our focus, and today He is right here with you. It doesn't matter what you've been going through this week. Does it matter what you've done? It, it doesn't even matter if you haven't been in church since Christmas or last Easter. Jesus is right here today with you in this place. Now see, here are two men who had experienced the death of someone they loved. Malcolm Muggridge said this, Every happening, great or small, is a parable whereby God speaks to us. And the art of life is to get the message. And that's what we want to do today, is to get the message that God is proclaiming in the, the life that we live. Life is challenging. Life is hard. Life is unpredictable. Can somebody please say amen? Am I the only one that struggles here? Help me out here. Help me preach today. I don't want to be up here all by myself. God is here to help you today. We all have the commonality in this room. It doesn't matter from that wall back, from that wall back, from that wall to that wall, over this way, back in the tech booth, back in the nursery. We all have one thing in common, and that is life is difficult. These men found themselves questioning the last few years and the last few days of their life. They found themselves wondering. What had they spent their time doing? What had they trusted in? And now it seems to be just completely upside down. In our daily lives, we often miss what God is doing. We can't look at these, these disciples and think, oh, we're not like them. I'm here to tell you, we're more like them than you actually think. Hold with me just for a few moments because I want you to consider something. Consider this. 
there is a key principle I want you to consider today. Consider this, and you can write this down. Number one is this, what I believe will determine what I see. Did you hear me? What I believe will determine what I see. Well, you say, Pastor, that doesn't seem to be so profound. That seems to be pretty common sense. It does, doesn't it? See, we're going to keep it simple. What you believe is what you will see. And we can see here, you find what you're looking for. These men, verse 16, after Jesus has come up and started talking with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Jesus is right there. The man who died on the cross is right there. They don't recognize who he is. And Jesus said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? Absolutely incredible. Their eyes were prevented, and I would actually have to say that the clues that we get from Scripture, it was their grief, their sadness, their hurt, and their pain. Why do you say that, Pastor? Why do you say that's in the Scripture? Because when we look at the end of verse 17, I want you to notice what it says. And they stood still, looking sad. When Jesus himself asked, what are these things that you're talking about? What are the words that you're exchanging? They stopped what they were doing and they were looking sad. Because what they had experienced and the pain that was deep within them and the hurt and the mess of their life had overwhelmed their faith. I don't know about you, but are there times in your life where life will overwhelm your faith? You'll feel like... I don't know which way to turn. I don't know what to say. I don't even know what to pray anymore. Because things have just gotten so tough. You know, sometimes our pain and grief will get in the way of seeing God's hand at work in our life. God can be working right in the midst of all of that. These men had gotten hold of the wrong word. Can I say that again? That was just good. These men had gotten hold of the wrong word. They were exchanging some words, and the words were about the death of Jesus and how their life had gotten turned upside down. For years, they had followed this man named Jesus. For years, they had, they had seen him perform miracles. They had seen him walk on water, probably, or heard the stories of, of Lazarus coming back from the dead, of great miracles taking place. And now they have found themselves... Wondering, have we put our hope and our faith in something that was false? I imagine that probably even went through their head because they are so focused on the death. Again, we can see this in what else they say here. In verses 18, and one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? By the way, have you ever said something and then later you go, Boy, that was some crow that I really need to eat. Here, here is Cleopas. He is actually walking with Jesus. And he says, Are you the only one in Jerusalem that don't know what's been going on? Hello, he is Jesus. He knows. He was the one nailed. He was the one in the grave. He's the one that's come back. But Cleopas is so blinded. That he can't recognize Jesus right there next to him. How many of us are blinded every Monday at work, every, every day we get our, our mail and we open it up and we see a bill? How many times are we blinded and we don't see Jesus working in all that and we don't see what Jesus is trying to do in our hearts that all we can do is just see the bad and not what God is doing? How many times does that happen in our life personally? Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, Jesus said this, What things? Really, did he have to ask that? No, Jesus did not have to ask it. But let me tell you who needed that question to be asked to and who needed answered. That was those men. See, Jesus could have just, you know, snapped his fingers, changed the whole dynamic of the moment, and changed everything. But I don't want you to miss the journey that Jesus took these two disciples on, on this road to Emmaus, because he does the same thing in your life each and every day. He may be taking you on a journey right now on a road somewhere. 
And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. See, there's your clue. We were hoping he was the one. But they're thinking, apparently he wasn't. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also, some women among us amazed us. Now that word amazed there does not necessarily mean it's a positive thing. It's just as if you get really bad news and you're just amazed and you're taken back by it. I received some news this week about a very dear friend of mine who passed away, 48 years old. Tremendous ministry, passed away. I was amazed. I was taken back. It wasn't good news. But this Greek word here doesn't mean that they were overjoyed. Pastor, how can you know that? Verse 11 of of chapter 24 tells us that these words that the women shared appeared to them as nonsense. They were like, what? Y'all don't know what you're talking about. That Jesus is not there? Follow me, though. Because... Verse 22, but also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him they did not see. Peter and John ran to the tomb, looked inside. They even went inside and saw the grave clothes. They saw that he was risen they believed, it says in, in, in John, but the other disciples, they just weren't sure about it. Oftentimes in our life, there are things that we're just not sure about. There are things about God that we struggle with. But your failure to embrace Jesus today is going to affect you being able to focus and see God tomorrow in whatever goes on. How you focus on Jesus today is going to affect your tomorrow. It's it's going to affect today, but your tomorrow is going to be affected as well. So that is why we must keep our eyes focused on Jesus every day. Do you want some hope today? Do you want some hope today? I do too. And I believe God's word gives it to us. And, and check this out. You, you don't want to miss this because the second thing that I, the, the, the first thing under believing is this that God's word is a catalyst for clearer vision. God's word is a catalyst for clearer vision in your life. How do we know this? Because look at what Jesus did. They could not even, they could not even recognize Jesus, Grant. He was walking right there with them. And what does Jesus use? Look at this. This is beautiful. Verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe. They were having a hard time believing. And all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the what? Somebody help me here. The scriptures. Jesus himself, after he's risen from the dead, with a resurrected body, uses the scripture on the journey of these men's life. Do not negate this in your life. So oftentimes we are trying to find hope in everything but this because we believe the lie that religion is the problem. Can I tell you something? Religion is a problem. But relationship with Jesus Christ is the solution. Religion is going to get you messed up, tore up, and upside down. But a relationship with Jesus Christ will get you fired up with your head up and you walking on holy ground. Scripture is what Jesus used. Should we not use that ourselves? 
If Jesus himself went to the scriptures to point to truth in these men's lives as they were really struggling, Jesus didn't say, well, here's the card of the local psychiatrist. Why don't you go for some counseling? He didn't say go to church Sunday and listen to the preacher. He didn't say just just listen to someone else tell you about it. He said let me show you, let me talk to you, let me me point to the Messiah that's in the Bible. And when he did that, some amazing things began to happen. Verse 27 says that then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. They had a Bible study, man. They had a Bible study. It was Old Testament survey, Abram. It was, it was we're going to start with Moses. Hey, by the way, Moses, he wrote Genesis and all that. So Jesus could have just started in Genesis and, and hit 315 where, it, where, where he's talking about that, that there would be a child born that was going to crush Satan's head. He could have started there and went through all the prophets and, and all the story of Israel. And by the time they got home, Something was stirring within them. See, Jesus brought the real word to them. See, they had, they had got the wrong word that Jesus was dead. They were walking believing Jesus was dead. But then they got the real word. The word from Jesus himself about the scriptures, about what God had declared. Psalms 119.105 says this, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's this right here. If this is not focal, a focal point in your life, it needs to be. No wonder you can't figure out which way to go or which way to turn. No wonder you're struggling emotionally or to have hope. If Scripture is not a, a basis for your foundation, your foundation is nothing but sand. It's going to be shaky. Every time the wind blows and bad things happen, you're, you're, you're just going to be rocking left and right. and you're, you're going to be going, well, I thought things were going to be good since I started going to church the last Easter. And things didn't turn out that way. Can I tell you, keep your feet planted on the Word of God and your feet will be rock solid no matter how the wind blows. Your roots are going to go deep in Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm here to tell you today, I don't just say this. I believe it. Because just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean that I haven't hurt. Last night, I stood in a funeral home. And I've been at, to many, many funerals. And I've been in a lot of funeral homes. I have seen babies. I have preached the, 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 a, a baby's funeral. I have seen people cry. But last night, I stood in a funeral home. And I looked at a man that I love very dearly that has impacted my life that passed away. And I found myself in a spot with tears. And I wanted to run and I wanted to get out of that place because I couldn't take it. But in that moment, I knew God was with me. And my wife was with me. And because of that, I had the courage and the strength to say, God, Help me grieve. Help me heal. And I know God's promises said that He will save those with a broken heart and those who are crushed in spirit. See, God's word is full of promises. And if you if you don't know those promises, you need to discover those promises and find out the truth, what God has said. To begin your journey to find hope, I believe it begins right here in Scripture. Not right there in your seat listening to me talk. It begins with you getting into this. Pastor, I don't know if I understand all of it. That's okay. Hey, can I confess something? I don't understand all of it either. There's parts of it that I still go, what? God, can I use wide out on this part? I don't like this part. There's things I struggle with. But I know that God has said it and I hold on to those promises and those things that I struggle with. I trust God to do a work in my heart. See, God brought, Jesus brought the real word to them. The revelation of hope did not happen in the Bible study, but the Bible study prepared their hearts for the revelation that would change their life. Can I tell you something? You can't have His presence without the Scripture. 
But you can't have the scripture without his presence. Because listen, you can read the Bible, but if you don't have him dwelling in your life, if you don't uh, commune with him, you're going to miss a lot what's what's in the scriptures. That's This is the second thing that I want you to notice here in the scriptures. Not only did God's word, was it a catalyst, but God's presence, God's presence is the power for life change. See, the scripture prepared their hearts for the revelation that was going to happen that was going to change their life. The Bible study led to a fellowship with him. They went from from a picture of the word to a life-changing event. It's like a still photo versus a video. I want to read verse 28. And they approached the village where they were going. And he he acted as though he were going to go farther. But they urged him, saying, notice they said, it says, urged him. They were desperate. They were saying, stay with us. For it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. (coughs) So he went in to stay with them. They asked him to stay, and he stayed with them. Verse 30. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Abram, would you come up here for a second? They asked Jesus to stay. And Jesus says, sure, I'll stay. That's a key part in your journey. You can't have Jesus on Sunday only. Jesus needs to stay in your house on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He needs to stay in your car. He needs to stay in your business. If you compartmentalize Jesus to only be at church, then you're going to miss what God's doing in your life because He's going to shake you so hard that you're going to get to a place where you're going to want nothing else but Jesus. So I beg you today to let him stay. Now don't miss this though. Oh, this is good. Abram, come here. What does it say Jesus did? He broke the bread, didn't he? So Jesus, he broke the bread. He began to give it to him. Look where his eyes is at. Abram, what do you see on my wrist? You see a spot. That's the natural tendency of man and woman. When you hand something to them, they're going to look. Do you know what they saw? You know what they saw when Jesus handed them the bread, Abram? (laughs) All of a sudden, Abram, they had heard him talk about the Scripture. They had this longing in their heart that they wanted to stay. They wanted him to stay, and he stayed with them. But when he broke the bread which was strange for a guest in someone's house. Normally it's the one who lived there. But Jesus broke the bread, and when he handed it to them, they saw the nail prints. They saw at that moment what would change their life forever. Thank you, Abram. See, what we don't realize is that Jesus wants to take us on a journey to a place that we can see him more clearly and see and it just be opened up into our life. See, Jesus could let somebody else serve the bread that day. But instead, Jesus did. So that when he handed the bread, they would see those nail prints in his hand. They got something you can't get from a preacher or a teacher. They got the presence of God. They saw the work of the cross up close. At that moment, the word became flesh and dwelt right in front of them. There was power in what Christ had done. The bread of life brought them life when he handed them the bread. Jesus can be your life. He is the bread of life. He wants to hand it to you with those nail-starred hands. And it's going to be you taking that journey with the scriptures, allowing him to speak into your life, and you staying with him a while. And then, let me tell you something, you're going to experience a new beginning. Some life change begin to take place because you're going to see things differently. See, they walked down down that seven-mile road to Emmaus without even realizing it was Jesus right next to them. How long did it take them to get there? Took them all day long. Their life changed when their eyes began to focus on something new. When their eyes began to see what Jesus had done on the cross in in, in the nail prints, they realized things were different because you can see here Verse 31, then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. 
What do you believe about Christ in your life? Let me tell you something. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in Him so that you may overflow with hope. See, I'm talking about Scripture here. This isn't my opinion. I'm not trying to get applause. I'm just telling you what, G- what God has written right here, that He wants to fill you to a place where you're overflowing with hope. But it only comes through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through a better job, a, a higher paycheck, or less bills. It doesn't come from a better husband or a better wife or better kids. It only comes from Jesus Christ Himself. The only place you're going to find hope. The power of the Holy Spirit is what will deliver that according to Romans. There's a change that took place in them and there's a change that can take place in us. Can I tell you something? Jesus is more than a baby in a manger. Jesus is more than a figure hanging on uh, an emblem of a cross. He's more than just a service that we come to at Easter. Jesus Christ is from Genesis to Revelation and there is a thread that runs through the whole thing ushering in the story of God that God Himself has a redemptive plan for all of us to give us hope in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Let me just go ahead and let you know this. There's only one way to reconcile your relationship with God and that's through Jesus Christ. It's not through you coming to church every Sunday. It is not going to be from you reading your Bible. It's not going to be from you being baptized. Let me tell you something. You can get baptized, you'll get wet and go to hell if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter what books you read, what other philosophies you believe in, what other church you go to, or what other religions you have checked out. Jesus Christ has declared He is the one and the only that left heaven and came to earth to pay the price for you so you don't have to do anything to get to Him except for just surrender. See, all the other religions of the world is going to tell you you got to dress up, fix up. you got to remember this, you got to remember that. you got to do it right, you can't do it wrong, or you will not be able to get in. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus said, all that don't matter. All you got to do is just come up, give yourself to me. I've already paid the price. Jesus Christ is the answer. <laughs> Whew. I'm getting a little excited. It's Easter. You know what? I got lunch. I don't know. Y'all dig in your pocketbook and find something. <laughs> well, let's talk about change for a second. What changed in their life? First thing that changed is this, what they saw. See, they saw a dead man taken off the cross, put into a tomb, and they saw his body missing. All they saw, all they believed was Jesus is dead. But boy, when that change took place, no longer was Jesus dead. He was alive. This gets good. You better fasten your seatbelt. Remember what they said earlier? They were talking about the things that had happened. And Jesus said, what things? Well, about Jesus dying. That was the word. That was their perception. That is what they saw. But look, look at verse 31. Then they recognized Their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They saw something different and the change took place. They saw something different and their whole life got turned upside down and they got something brand new. What changed? They listened. They dwelt with him. They heard the scriptures. Once they encountered the glory of God in first hand in the finished work of Christ, they could no longer see things like they used to see them. Can I tell you that when Jesus comes into your life, you won't see the things like you used to see. My mom and dad sang a song that uh, it's, this is an old song. It says I don't go back to the places I used to go. I don't hang out with the people I used to know. I don't go to those bars anymore. I am focused on Christ. Let me tell you something. Jesus will change your life and you'll see things completely different. Maybe your problem isn't a focus problem. Maybe your problem is a Jesus problem. You don't have enough of him or you don't know him. And I'm here to tell you today, unless you have him, you will never be able to see things any different than you do right now. All you're going to see is the trouble, the hurt, the pain. You're going to see the debt. You're going to see the problems. You won't see the glory that is to come in the resurrected body that's going to be yours. Second thing, not only is it what they saw, it's what they felt. Verse 32. They said to one another, 
were not our hearts burning within us while we were speaking to while he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us see what they felt on the road was something completely different before Jesus came along they were hurting they were grieving and then Jesus came along beside them and their hearts began to burn and Jesus even said at one time uh, up, up in verse 25, oh foolish man and slow of heart to believe. They had a heart problem. They had a heart condition. I'm not talking about a Northeast Georgia uh, Ronnie Green Heart Center heart problem. I'm talking about a heart with Jesus Christ problem of faith and believing because their, their pain, their, that life had gotten them in such a place, they couldn't see the presence of God. But can I tell you something? It doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't change the, the fact that God is present in your life trying to draw you to Him. He is working, trying to do something in your life. doesn't matter which way you want to turn or run. You can go in the opposite direction. But God declares He wants you to be part of His life. He wants to be part of your life. Not only did it change what they saw and what they felt. Look at verse 33. And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Hold on a second. Mr. Merck, they walked seven miles and it took them all day. It took them all day to go seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. But according to this verse, after recognizing who Jesus was, they got up that very hour and they got all the way back to Jerusalem tell the other disciples what do you think they did I think they ran they began to run because something had happened and it changed what they did they no longer walked with their head down they ran with their head up because they had experienced life change with Jesus when they saw when they saw the cross become flesh right in front of them when he was resurrected it changed what they did see Jesus changed from just an image of hope to the essence of hope in their life. Someone needs a new focus today. Someone in this room needs a new focus. You need a change in your feet. You need a change in your word. You need a change in your life. The word declares it can happen. Jesus took these men on a journey. Seven mile journey. David Platt said, this is how God works. He puts his people in positions where they are desperate for his power. And then he shows his provision in ways that display his greatness. Maybe we don't let our feet walk like Jesus or our hands work like Jesus or our mouth talk like Jesus because we haven't become desperate enough. Maybe we are trusting so much in us Maybe it's to the point where we think we have all the answers. And because of that, because of that, we, we don't think about Jesus much. Everything else in the world is important. There's going to come a time. There's going to come a time when you're going to be desperate. God's going to allow, there's going to be things that's going to happen in your life where you're going to become desperate and you're going to begin to cry out and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you every hour. These men were in a desperate place in their life. The question is not, where is God when bad things happen? The question is this, where are you in relationship with God when bad things happen? That's the question that's really going to matter. I don't know where you are today. I can tell you this, the journey had to do with an honest revelation of their heart. It began with that. It began with a confession to say, we're hurting. This stuff has happened in Jerusalem and we don't understand it. It began with just an honest, absolute confession. Maybe you don't understand it today. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you don't know what to do next. Maybe Jesus and this whole religion thing, the only reason you showed up today was because you're here because of family or somebody invited you. But I'm here to tell you, you're here because God brought you here today. He drew you here. You could have said no, but you came. God wants you to just be honest with Him today. Second thing is this. Take God's Word, Scripture, as your base don't let it just be based on what I say. Let it be based on what He has already said. 
Scripture has said that we have all sinned and fallen short. We've all messed up. That includes me. That includes you. But by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we can have salvation. And dwelling with Christ changed their life because when Jesus came and stayed with them, that's when they truly, truly had a revelation and a life change that impacted them for the rest of their life. Where are you today? I don't know where you might be struggling. I don't know what's been going on in your life this week. I don't know how you've hurt. I don't know what you've thought about or what questions you have had. But can I tell you something? Now's a great time to talk to God about it. Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes right now? Bow your head, close your eyes. And ask God, what are you to do? Just simply say to Him, what am I to do, God, with this message? See, God knows more about what's going on in your heart than I do. But I can tell you this. God's got hope for you. He's got a plan. He's got something that maybe you've not been able to see. And it's going to take some surrender on your part. Why don't you just be honest with Him right now? Tell God where you are. Maybe you've begun this journey. Maybe you've got questions. Maybe you don't have it all figured out. That's okay, I don't either. But the journey of faith is not about the logical answers that you can put into your brain. Sometimes it just takes taking a step to say, I believe it, even though I don't understand it. If today you doubt whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have that close personal relationship with Him, you're at the right place. These men began by just making a confession. Say, God, say to Jesus, we're hurting. Maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe that's your next step is to just to simply this morning just slip up your hand and just say, I need prayer because I'm struggling. I don't know about my relationship with Jesus. I'm not sure where I am with God right now. I see those hands. Somebody else confessed today. You're not sure. You're, you're doubting your salvation. You don't know if you'll die and go to heaven. You just don't know about your relationship with Jesus. Is there someone else that will confess today? And raise your hand. I see those hands. I see those hands. Can I tell you, you can know. Jesus didn't die on the cross and raise from the dead so it can be a maybe so. He did it so that you could know for sure. Maybe your next step today is just to simply say, I'm going to get in the Word and I'm going to get plugged in somewhere here at Chicopee or at your home church. That might be your next step. But get in the Word every day. Even if you don't completely understand it, get in the Word. Maybe you need to just make a commitment today to Jesus Christ and just say, Jesus, will you stay with me? Will you stay in my heart? Will you stay in my life? Will you come and dwell in my home, in my car, at work, at at the ball field? Everywhere I go, I want you to dwell. That means you're surrendering your life to Him. You're turning your life over. You're saying, I've messed up. God, forgive me. Take over my life. It's that simple. Let me tell you, if you do not know Jesus today, maybe you didn't slip up your hand, but you're, you're doubting, you were afraid to lift up your hand, I've, I've got good news for you. It's as simple as this. First thing is just to say, I've messed up, God. The second thing is to say, God, forgive me for how I've messed up. And the third thing is simply is just, just say, God, take over my life. Jesus, take over my life, every part of it, the places that even my wife or my husband don't even know about. Will you do that today? Father, we thank you for your word and the power of it. Do a work within us right now. Change our hearts, oh God, and make us anew. Let today be a new beginning for someone as we stand this morning and as we sing, whatever your next step is, it may be to come down here and just kneel and pray. It could be to come take my hand. It could be to take somebody else's hand and ask them to come with you. Whatever your next step is, will you do that right now as we stand and as we sing? Search me, oh God.
Amen. Today is a beautiful, beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, John, would you come up here and dismiss us in prayer this morning? John Smith. This boy can pray. I love to hear him pray. And I w- I'd just like to say this to you today as we leave. Don't forget about the lilies that are out front. If you have somebody you'd like to give one of those to, it's first come, first serve. But listen, we're all grown ups. No pushing or shoving or tripping out there, okay? <laughs> or, or you can come see Miss Shelvia right over here. Raise your hand. Or you're going to be out there. She's going to be out there, and, and she will help you find one or, or, or help you out in some way out there. Um, th- that, that is a gift to you today. And uh, I want to say this before he prays. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in Him so that you may overflow. Somebody say overflow. Overflow Overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll be right back here by these brown doors if you need to talk to me, if that's your next step. Brother John. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you that... You didn't make us work to you, God, that you came down freely, Lord, because we cannot ascend the heights to where you are. Lord God, we pray that you would change lives today. You would change all our lives. Um, Those that don't know you, Lord, I pray that you would be introduced today, God, that they would see you for who you are, God, see your beauty and your power, Lord. For those of us who know you, God, that you would draw us deeper into love, God, deeper into dependence, deeper into your power, Lord know the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. God, to be conformed to your death. God, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us. God, be close to us, Lord. God, and we just thank you for who you are, Lord. I pray that you would keep us safe as we go home, Lord, and be with all those who are struggling today, Lord, that you would heal any sick, God, and just be with those that are hurting, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen.